Hi, thank you so much for coming to story time. I wanted to share three fairy tales, the magic of three, right? From this book, the book, with you. And I bound this book myself. I've never done that before. Um, so it was really fun and really immersive. And I put some moss and some 3D butterfly stickers, some sparkly gold tape, and the cover is made of a really nice soft felt, all part of the immersive theme. Oh, and how could I forget this little green ribbon bookmark? We will get to ribbons in these stories. You'll see. Okay. Once Upon a Time, the book by me. And the first story is called The Child and the Dog. <clears throat> Once upon a time, there was a town. And in this town was a girl. She lived in a house at the top of a small hill in a village which was tucked into the hook of a great and terrible sleeping dragon's tail. The other villagers didn't mind much the dragon, you see, for he kept the wolves and the wild dogs away from the livestock with his presence and warmed the air with puffs of breath, and otherwise he left them all alone. Pardon me, I've gotten itch. <laughs> The townsfolk said it was best to let him sleep, but the girl and her house and her family knew better. Every morning she left for school and would tiptoe quietly around the dragon, head low and scurrying down the hill. And every evening she'd make her way back up the hill and hope that the dragon still slept. It was a hard way to live, and they could not afford to move, nor did they want to forfeit their land. But her life was not without joy. No, not in the least. She'd spend many hours on the rolling fields and in and out of forest thickets, scouring the rocky beaches tucked into the cliff bottoms nearby for shells, with her cousins and her sibling. They were more than contented with the nature they all found, and they were content to make believe. They worried not of dogs nor wolves, because the dragon was still nearby, and surely he'd be the most fearsome thing in their lives. But still they were watchful as they imagined of horses with wings, and they let their feet dance over the grass, and their eyes wandered the trees for imagined creatures. And perhaps the imagination was so powerful that it lent itself to corporeality. One day, the girl caught a glimpse of a creature, a large, black dog, running behind a boulder as she and her companions played. She gasped and, though fearful, ran after it, looking around the boulder's edge and deep into the trees beyond, all to no avail. None of the others had seen it, and they, and their parents, and their friends, and all the townsfolk told her she'd imagined it after all. They said that she was young, and there hadn't been a creature like that around in years, and that they knew best about these things. But the girl knew that she knew best. Perhaps if it had been the one time, she'd have dismissed it. But the dog began to show up more and more often, in dreams, incessant scratching on the back door, and darting across her field of vision, only to disappear in the space between opening her eyes and shutting them. She never saw its face incomplete, only parts and blurs, the flash of a tooth, an ear flapping over to obscure it, the white of an eye, and it had begun. And when she forgot it, or thought it had gone, or that she had indeed made it up to begin with, that's when the dog would return again. She stopped telling the townsfolk or her family when she'd see the dog, 
They'd never believe her, never understand. She didn't even understand the creature. How had it dared persist in the midst of the great and terrible dragon when all the other wild dogs and wolves had turned tail and ran? And how could a beast so fearless turn away in fear of her, of all creatures? Or maybe it wasn't afraid at all. Perhaps it was biding time for something. She played outside still, but quieter, with her eyes on the tree line constantly checking the dragon for signs of movement more, um, as the dog encroached on the dragon's territory. What did it want, and why could she alone catch it in her eye? Despite the dragon and the dog ever present, still the child grew older. The dragon slept, and occasionally stretched his wings and roared and then slept again. The black dog persisted in the way it always had, and she'd learned to accept it for the lurking thing that it was, the same way she had learned to step over the dragon's tail each morning and each night. The black dog grew bolder and more pitifully demanding of the girl's gaze, scratching and whining at her door, even daring to place his chin upon her leg under the dinner table and beg for scraps, only to cower and vanish away when she'd look down at him. And she would only look, never letting him in, nor throwing down scraps to eat, nor trying to trap him and make him stay, and a strange guilt nod as she began to feel as though he kept returning to her for her for a reason, like he was meant to show her something important. Was she being cruel? Was she responsible for him? Did she even have anything to spare to offer at all? She had given all she had to the day, every day, rushing out of the door in the morning and staying away until the dragon had gone to stretch his wings or until he slept soundly. She tucked deep into the halls of her school and in all her occupations, she took to taking walks along the long green brook path just beyond the boulder, in the woods where she'd first seen the dog. She'd duck under one low branch, then another, and one more beyond there until she'd find the suitable place to balance binders and books upon her knees and sit cross-legged in the dirt. The dog would bring her sticks, sometimes, if she avoided looking at him, and she'd roll her eyes and pick them up without a word. She'd carry them home and place them in her closet and forget them, and that was, if she had the time, of course, to remain there until the sun had leaned down to kiss the edge of the sky. What time had she for a stray dog, and one who wouldn't face her at that? But... There was something about the creature, still, which she could not quite name. On such an evening, the sky's light faded and she headed home. She was tall enough now to reach up and touch the higher branches with ease while she walked, the dog lingering beside her in the corner of her eye. He's quite a persistent beast, she thought, stepping over the dragon's tail. I can scarcely imagine my life without him now. And still, thinking upon this as she lay in bed, awaiting the scratching sound which came like clockwork upon the door, she made a decision. Scratch, scratch, scratch. The girl slid out of bed quietly and padded across the floor, the moonlight casting shadows on the floors and walls of the quiet bedroom. Scratch, scratch, scratch. As she placed her hand on the doorknob, the scratching ceased. She listened and waited, and held her breath as she swung it open anyway. There the creature stood, head turned to the side. Her heart leapt, the adrenaline catching up all at once. Well, come on then, the girl said as casually as she could manage, turning on her heel and going back to bed. She pulled the blanket over her head, pulse beating wild under her skin, and waited. Scratch, scratch. Her eyes flew open at the sound, and she poked her head out to see the black dog sitting in front of her closet door, his head still turned away. Gathering her courage once more, the girl pulled the covers back and crept wearily over to the closet door where he pawed at the wood. 
Slowly, she reached out and turned the knob, pulling the door open to reveal the shadowy black of the small, cluttered space. The dog gave a, gave a quick, sharp bark and darted inside, his midnight fur blending into the darkness. The girl peered in after him, squinting to try to make him out, but she didn't have to wait long. He poked his snout back out at her, holding a stick between the teeth. She tentatively reached down and took it, and as she had so many times before, and he disappeared once more. He returned with another stick, which she took again and again and again. When the sticks all piled up and weighed so heavily on the girl that she felt she could not bear another, she heard the dog whine. Craning her neck to see around the massive heap of wood scraps in her arms, she saw his head in profile turned away again and waiting patiently. Thank you, she said this time, and the dog's ears perked up. He turned his face to meet hers, revealing a second head conjoined at the beast's neck. The second head blinked those eyes at her, and she understood, and she knew them both at once now. So she cast the sticks aside gently in a heap upon the floor and went to them both with open arms. She threw her arms around them, and as she wept her gratitudes and joy, they licked her tears and were content. And that is the end of that story. There we go. And then this is for the next story. Story number two, which is called The Siren's Red String. Are y'all ready for this one? <laughs> okay. Hold on. Ooh, water break, actually. All right. Once upon a time, there was a siren whose voice could spin seaweed into string. Her talents were of extreme and unrivaled value to the fair sea folk of her village, and with neighboring cove dwellers and naval human travelers as well, for her strands took on the shape of whatever emotions colored her song. There was thick, cozy brown yarn from the low, calm, and warm tones of a hum, or deep, dark, blue, silky, smooth lengths to be had when she was feeling particularly dangerous. Of all the materials and weights and colors she'd spun over the years of singing each morning, day, and night as she was moved, her favorite, the rarest and most unbreakable kind, was the red. It had started when she was very young, a marvelous ship made of fine dark brown wood and strong white billowing sails would pass through but once a year, which carried a sailor and his son among the crew. A sailor's life is hard and weathered, but the boy was ever curious, intelligent, and kind, and she liked to see him. The young siren would only watch him at first when the ship would come by and drop its anchor at the largest rock to trade for goods, including thread, to mend their nets and their sails. He would climb the rocks and dive beneath the waves, laughing with the salt of the water in his hair and the sun warming golden on his cheeks. He'd feed the birds and stroke their feathers slowly and gently for all his energy, and they'd all come, as he called them, the boy reminded her of a siren in this way, his charm so honest and sweet. She felt pulled in as well, and pulled she was. She'd grow closer and closer with each passing year as she observed him, and finally, when he called out to her once, she went to him, spinning red thread to give him and him alone. One year... One time that the boy's ship came, his father did not come with them, and the crew looked worse for the wear. This time they came in search of thread to mend themselves, to stitch their wounds, 
and the siren obliged them until the sunlight faded and the song grew old and thin along with it. Each sailor had come and heard her sing and taken string. Then each had gone with a grateful nod or a murmured thank you or with no kind word at all. By the end of the evening, her voice was hoarse, her throat dry and raw, though her heart was hurting too, full of sympathy and sadness. Her hands ached from passing the seaweed through them all day long, above water, in her spinning. In the moment's reprieve she had now, they laid gingerly on her lap as she sat perched half on land with her tail in the water, waving absently in the tide. Alas, my work is not yet done, thought the siren, determined and weary in nearly equal parts. For the boy, no longer a child, just like she was, now stood before her in the shadow of falling nighttime, cradling an open wound sliced into his chest. Her eyes widened in dismay, seeing his shirt, soaked bloody and dark, and his face grimaced tight with pain and dizziness. She lifted her hands as if to steady him as he staggered closer and half sat, half fell, but the sudden, painful motion made her wince in spite of herself. He took note of it, as he must have taken note of all the pains of the rest of the crew before his own, she thought. And as she, threw, as she drew a breath to try to sing once more, he stopped her, gently, ever gently with a hand lightly grazing over her wrist. He reached then for a small, ornate vial hanging around his neck, glittering in the moonlight, and unstopped it, holding it over her hands. A parting gift from my mother to my father from many years ago, he explained softly, voice crackling with disuse and emotion. It will help and the young man poured the golden liquid over her dry and aching skin, soothing the expanse of it in an instant. He saved one drop and added it to his fresh drinking water pouch, which he held out to her. Her renewed fingers brushed his and made her shiver as she took it gratefully. The siren lowered her gaze as she drank, feeling the healing magic take effect just as quickly as it had before, and when she passed back the drink, she looked up at him, a new song filling her heart as it did, as she did. She sang, and all the night birds fell silent to listen. Even the wind and the waves of the sea herself calmed and waited with bated breath as she spun her red thread for him. He leaned in, entranced, his pain forgotten for those few moments as they watched one another with open eyes, an emotion she had no name for colored the song and bled the gifted potion's golden magic into the strands, giving them a shimmering iridescence. She waved her hand over his chest, and the magic thread did as it was bid, suturing seamlessly over the wound and then healing the skin there. As the wound healed and her song came to an end, the world resumed around the two of them, and the young man's head dropped in relief onto the siren's shoulder. He sighed, burying his face and her long, beautiful hair. She embraced him and let several moments pass this way before drawing back, shyly, uncertain, to ask him. This gift... It is special to you. You would make a parting gift of it to me? He shook his head slightly and smiled, with a kind of sadness that not, had not underscored his usual carefree grins. Still, it was a smile all the same, she thought, and he is beautiful. No, not in parting. He took the loose end of her red string between his fingers and tied it gently around his finger. But I would give it. I would share it. And that is the end of that story. And I actually have a little bit of red string. Oh, you can't tell it's red in the sliding. Oh, I guess you can. 
I've taped it down so it'll stay, but very immersive, <laughs> if I do say so myself. All right, we are on our last story, and this one is a bit shorter if you're already bored or tired. <laughs> I hope you're not bored. Uh, but this one is called The Witch and Her Birds. Once upon a time, there was a witch in a cottage hidden deep in the enchanted forest. She had lived in solitude for as long as she could remember, making tea for one and reading the leaves, looking for signs, gardening flowers and vegetables and herbs that only she'd enjoy. And she told herself it was enough, because she knew... It was what she must do and what she must be to survive. Since she could not remember a time away from the cottage, she could not conceive a need to leave her corner of the secluded wood. And what if there is nothing else for me? She'd ask herself. I must create the peace that I can. She liked to paint and sing and read and write, so these things made her world a little larger and kinder. She made herself quite busy in her way, and she'd share her troubles with the birds. The forest was full of them, little black-capped ones that went, Phoebe! The morning doves, which would come out at dusk and at dawn again, woodpeckers with their noise, and crows with intelligent sh stares and loud calls of conviction. Many more. And when she felt particularly sorrowful, she'd wave her hands and make a bird of that, too, to join her sky companions in their winged freedom. Though born of sadness, their songs were lovely giving voice to the pain that the witch could not bear on her own. She knew not where they went in their travels, but they always returned a bit lighter than before. Sometimes the birds came back with a message of greeting tied to the leg, or taught to the bird through careful training of song. Some came with bells on, or flowers, or a ribbon and the messages from faraway lands became a lifeline to the outside world for the witch, as she got to know each of their handwritings and language lilts by heart. The witch went on this way for some length of time, sending messages back and forth and filling her heart with this new joy, until she realized that while her routine was comfortable in many ways, and that it was nice to not feel so alone anymore, and that there were many things she loved about where she was, with the trees and her garden and her warm hearth, that she had finally found the promise of something else for herself, which she feared did not exist. So she made new plans, harvested some seeds to sow somewhere new, and one morning, she sent one final message out on a bird before starting out. A single daisy tied to the leg of a dove to convey the meaning, I'm on my way. She gathered up all the rest of her dear birds and tied a magic string to each one, securing the other end to a large basket woven from all the flowers she'd been given and grown herself. It was adorned with the bells and ribbons, too, so her friends would see her coming. She set off inside it on a gentle guiding wind into something else, and she knew sorrow no more. And then I put a little daisy in there. Yeah, that's it. That's the story. There's some room for more fairy tales in here, so stay tuned. Okay, thank you so much for watching and listening. I hope you have a great day, night, whatever's going on for you. And... Goodbye.